Um, I grew up like like everybody, you know, kind of slumber parties, watching horror. Um, but what always stood out to me since I was a kid was the rules. And if the horror movie didn't have rules, I was not scared. Nightmare on Elm Street to me was such a smart, like uh, just smart log line alone that Craven did that he attacked something that nobody can avoid, sleep. And I thought that was such a cool way in that no matter where you're from, what you do, you have to go to sleep. And I think that that's always been the difference to me from Freddie and Jason or Michael Myers is that Jason and Michael Myers, the, the rules kind of don't apply. Um, it, it, it's pretty straightforward, which is a fun little ride, right? It's a roller coaster ride. And I, I still have fun with those movies, but Nightmare to me was always, the imagination was boundless. But I just loved how that kind of sparked such imagination, even in in horror, which at the time, a lot of people, some people put their nose up at it. And, and, and that drives me insane because the storytelling in horror is, is fascinating. As you got older, college age, you eventually ended up at UCLA. Um, and I think definitely, you know, you were a pitcher for the baseball team at the time. You were all American. What kind of led you to the side then that like, Filmmaking was the career path you wanted to go down. It was secretly there for me all along since I was five. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be good at baseball and I uh, I had opportunities at LSU, Florida State, Texas. Um, so really great schools. I had a, um, a pretty good senior year uh, in high school. And what I secretly was trying to do is kill two birds. So, um, so secretly that was the that was the plan all along whether my coach and my parents and everybody else knew that's what i was trying to do um and and i think what's funny is in doing that um pitching taught me a lot about directing in a way um because to me it's always been as a pitcher either the team wins the game or you lose the game and i've always been fine with that take as much as you can on your sh shoulders and do the best you can, but you are responsible for what happens that day. Um, and I kind of take that approach the same way to film. Um, and I think it's helped me. Um, you pitch a couple of scripts around, they don't really get anywhere. Uh, so you and Zach, you eventually land on the idea for the house's October bill. Well, what happened right before that, that kind of, we were frustrated in a way because Zach and I had written together since high school, back and forth and, and, and tons of scripts along the way. Um, when I had left school, um, I got offered free agency with the Rangers and I, I wanted to take it, but I just knew that I would be, I could be 30 years old, still in the minor leagues. And I'd be so far behind what I really wanted to do. We had gotten close to selling scripts. We had sold one actually that never came to fruition, never was made. So that was a way to still be involved without doing what we wanted to do yet. When we had the idea for House October built, what we wanted to do, nobody had ever put a haunted house really on the big screen. Uh, Toby Hooper's Fun House in like 1980, but that's carnival. Like that's not what we were doing. And at the time, Paranormal Activity had just come out and blown up. So every exec was like, okay, so when the ghost comes, when? And I'm like, I, no, this, that's we're doing the opposite of that. We're gonna make this as grounded as we can be. So um, we decided, we literally did, we, Kevin Smith did, ran credit cards and we were like, we are in a lot of trouble if this doesn't work, um, but we believed it. And what's funny is it took it back to basically the same execs that told us no um, after the fact and, and Fox and New Regency ended up buying it. And we uh, got to open for Eli Roth. He was winning the Horror Director of the Decade um, award at in um, an LA film festival and we got to open for him, which was cool because it was a sold out theater. There was four or 500 people, but they were all there to see him. Nobody knew anything about the movie, but they had to sit through our movie to then get to mm -hmm. his presentation. The, the credits, well, there's no credits, it's cut to black. And we were supposed to do a Q and A after. And I was like, this audience feels like we're dead. They don't know what they watched. Mm -hmm. um, and I grabbed the film direct or uh, film festival director, and I was like, "We're not doing the Q and A. Cut it. I promise you, cut it." And Zach and I and the rest cast went up into the projection room and hit. And at the end, we had glow sticks everywhere for people under their seats. So we turned off all the lights in the theater. They had to get their glow sticks to even get out of the theater. That made me feel really good. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so obviously, once the movie releases, you know, it kind of makes a big, it makes a pretty big splash. Um, I know that it's a movie that is often now played every October. Or people try to get it in every October, um, which I imagine is a really cool feeling getting to have a movie that is almost kind of essential to a lot of people around like Halloween around that time of year. Am I am I grateful and stuff that's in people's rotation? A hundred percent. Like that that makes me feel awesome. Like every time I see that pop up, because a movie that's fantastic can still die away in three years and never come back, right? So having that is 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 great. But I I hoped that it would be in a rotation because I thought there was a, at the time not a lot of movies around Halloween. Like even the movie Halloween isn't really about the holiday. Um, and so kind of that was the intention and, and I'm glad it's, you know, that, that it still resonates with people. That, that And with the first film ending in a way where it is essentially a cliffhanger for a continuation, moving on to the sequel, kind of when did the ideas for the sequel start coming about? Was it um, like towards like the end of the production of the first one, you were like, okay, if this is successful, we are going into a sequel. We had always kind of envisioned this, the three to four movies, three for sure, and have this big story arc that we we're gonna mm-hmm. do. Um, that idea to me was the only way I think that, uh, to me that you could scare somebody again, especially this group that has gone through, they were numb to a lot of things, right? And I thought the interactiveness um, akin to, like David Fincher's The Game, that kind of flip-flop on you. It's just literally one of those things that I wanted to be able to give people a haunted house experience without being in a haunted house. And 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 because I always say that we're kind of desensitized, it's why we now have 4D theaters. Mm-hmm. Uh, because now we need it to rain on us because we don't, 3D is not enough. Um, obviously the first one got around with the haunt community so when it came time to make the sequel um, did you have a lot of haunts reaching out to you being like hey we think our haunt would be a great feature for your movie to make the first one we had to like beg like nobody knew what we were doing some people had their guard up like what are these guys doing here Um, and then with the, the with the success of the first one with the sequel it's funny there's like it came with its own problems but then it came with its own perks um yeah we were probably contacted every other day by haunts which was awesome trying to say well okay will you please come shoot here because they knew we'd shoot at probably four or five of them um and i just it was important to me for part two to try to find as many different halloween experiences we had done haunts in the first one and so with the second one, I wanted to find as much of a variety as I could because as awesome as a haunt is first person, some of them on screen start to turn into a dark labyrinth and I didn't want them to start blending together. Uh, thematically, whatever the haunt was, I needed it to be out there. That's why in two, we go to that adult haunt, um, the zombie pub crawl. Um, I mean, there was 30,000 people dressed as zombies in Minneapolis and then um, trying to shoot within that was tough. And so that was, it was hard. We didn't have the same anonymity we did with the first one. Um, but, but, but with it, like we got to do, like I got to go toe to toe with Kobayashi mm-hmm. in the, you know, a brain eating contest, which is, I got my ass kicked, but it doesn't matter. Like to go toe to toe with the best in the world. Um, you know, that was really, really cool. Um, but, and then the 5k in, uh, in Georgia, that was a million square foot facility. You do a zombie marathon, zombie 5K, um, and to be able to use that facility, the 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 subway, we were up in an army helicopter. Um, all those experiences to me, it was it was just important because I could have gone down the normal list of amazing, amazing haunts, but I just wanted to make sure that we were having a little bit of a different vibe and kind of expanded the scope. What are sort of some of the haunts that you haven't that haven't been featured in the movies? that you would like just like to give like special shout outs to or just really give like the haunts that have just really impressed you over the years that you've been able to visit them when covid hit and we were like okay 
haunt community is going to be super impacted by this, right? I mean, that's about as up close and personal as you can get. And a lot of them had to shut down. And so instead, Zach and I figured out, we were like, look, how can we showcase these haunts? If we're not filming part three right now, we started um, a site called Haunt Society. And what we wanted to do is showcase, you know, our featured haunts, some of our favorite haunts, and kind of give them a platform, not a directory type thing, but a showcase, like give them their whole page, like a baseball card. Um, and so we started getting these uh, featured haunts that that we kind of endorse around the United States. So I think that um, to kind of answer your questions, like there's some really cool ones. If you've ever heard the 17th door, uh, they just changed to a new location in Buena Vista, California. Um, but that's 17 doors and you're signing waivers, but not in a McCamey way, mm -hmm. you know, still scary, but unlike anything I've ever seen in Ohio, we went in to um, uh, Terror Town. So it's All Hallows Eve has this big, they had bought this giant Western community. So it was almost like a, um, could have been an amusement park, but it was a it was this full on Western town um, and they bought it and flipped it into this whole narrative about zombies, cowboys, witches. So when you go there, it's not just walking through a haunt. You are walking through a town. Things happen along the way. There's like a witch hanging. Somebody's burned like they try to keep as 1880 as they can uh, with this whole supernatural uh kind of tone that's 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 you don't know who's real who's fake that kind of thing um when it comes to recommending horror films um what are kind of horror films or if there's one specific movie that you can cite what is a horror film recommendation that you will always give to people i love love lake mungo it, it might be the most authentic like like i'm pretty sure this was real found footage movie mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's great. And I, I, you know, I hope that filmmaker keeps making more movies. I haven't seen anything since, to be honest, but, but all in all, that's kind of my favorite go-to that, because I don't like recommending anything obvious, um, you know, but I think for some, a lot of people, they just, they've never heard of it. Um, and I think it always goes over well, because it's, it's great. Barely see it streaming anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and and they, you know, they showed a lot of restraint, which is really hard when you're doing a studio film because they, at the end of the day, they want that roller coaster ride and that slow burn is not what a lot of people are in the business of. And and, and to be honest, they're not completely wrong. A lot of people change the channel, right? Like they're, they, they, if when streaming, you're not, I was trying to tell somebody the other day that when, when we, when I was a little kid and you went to Blockbuster, it was still, it was like 599, so it was six bucks. And whatever you rented, you watched, even if you hated it, you finished it because you were like, I spent six bucks, I did it. And you may even watch it again and hate it because that was your night. And there's been an interesting thing. I read some article there talking about that the cult movies are completely dead because no one will stay with the, with the film long enough if it's a slow burn now because they're not invested. They didn't pay for it the same way and they can just move on to the next one in five minutes, um, you know, without any repercussions. Um, so, I, I commend a lot of those movies that kind of took their time. Um, you know, I, I remember kind of, I had to pull.